I found something else that I hadn't thought about in 25 years that now as I look with all the other happenings that we were in the middle of at the time, I didn't realize the the lasting impact they were going to have, just the the chaos at the moment. But what happened between February and May of 1997 there was originally Sean and Brett's rematch was planned for WrestleMania, but Sean in Lowell, Massachusetts on the raw in what February lost his smile and decided he had a, it was at February, or early March, lost his smile, decided that he had a career ending knee injury and relinquished the WWF title and threw the goddamn WrestleMania plans into turmoil to where Vince went back to, you know, what he always knew, which was big guys. But in this case, it became Undertaker and Sid, which was never, <laughs> never a goddamn, you know, going to be a Matt classic. But also at the time, it wasn't what had been being pointed to, what had been being built. And then also um, the co-feature match was Bret Hart and Steve Austin, which ended up being one of the great matches of all time in the WWF, but not a money-drawn match at the time because that hadn't been for the destination that they were pointing to as well on the TV build. So everything was up in the air. So Michaels turns the title in, relinquishes his smile, there's a final four on February 16th, 1997 on the In Your House pay-per-view to determine the champion between Bret Hart, Steve Austin, Undertaker, and Vader. And that, because it was, you know, last-minute promotion, did 154,800 buys. And that wasn't particularly great, but... What was worse was WrestleMania in March from Chicago, Rosemont Horizon, with Sid and Taker and Bretton Austin, the changed plans, did 275,000 buys. The year before in 96, with Sean and Bretton in the Iron Man match, it had done 437,000 buys, and they didn't think that was all that great. So it dropped over 150, 160,000 buys because of the last minute, blah, blah, blah. Then, about that time, it, I think the first week of March was when they did the broadcast, the raw television program, simulcast from Germany and wherever, where they played the tapes from Germany with live commentary. I've talked about this. That's where Vince got pissed because the overnight rating came in a 2.0. And the raw ratings had not been good for the previous several weeks to begin with. And that's when Vince goes crazy and brings in the goofball sending in all the ideas to make him part of the creative team. So that was late February, March, and into April 97. And then comes a survey. From the USA Network, I found this. This is a 15-page document that I had forgotten about because, again, I'd seen these in WCW when Turner Broadcasting would poll their employees or get people on the street, ask them a question or two, and they would send in shit like, well, Eddie Gilbert and Kevin Sullivan, maybe you could make them the team of Gilbert and Sullivan. And shit like that, and just inane and the Jim Hurd kind of shit. Well, if we had a one arm, a one legged wrestler, we could make him Long John Silver and tie it into the movie. So I never looked at these things because they're all fucking caca, right? But I look at this now and I look at all the other documents that I found. This is a sheet that has all the raw ratings for each week and then the pay per view buy rates once a month and the money matches. So you can see what who was on top and what they drew. And I see the raw, the raw, not only the raw that Shawn Michaels lost his smile on was a special Thursday night episode because I think that we got 
preempted that week due to the dog show or some shit. Talk about a dog show. But all this stuff's going on at the same time. Vince's champion goes home. His WrestleMania tanks. The TV ratings, because everybody told him that Germany thing was a shitty show and a shitty idea, and he wouldn't listen. So, boom, the ratings are bad, and the USA Network in May on May 22nd sends him this survey. And all these, and this survey went to Shane McMahon, Linda McMahon, Jim Ross, Jim Cornette, Vince Russo, Kevin Dunn, a guy named Jim Bell who was in marketing, Basil DeVito who was in the office, and some, I don't know, I can't read that scribbling. No Bruce? Um, you know what? Uh, well, no, at this point, because remember, Bruce was in the office now, so Bruce didn't get copied this because me and Shitstain were the creative team. That's That became the problem. When Bruce was around, he was a buffer between me and the other guy. Because Bruce can put on that cheerful face and talk pleasantly and coexist with anybody, right? Neither me nor Shitstain had those fucking qualities. So without him in between us, you know, it, it, we're ready to fucking go for each other's eyes. But anyway... Wayne Becker from USA Network, he was... Uh, one of the executives at USA in charge of, well, he's vice president of sports programming. That's what his goddamn letterhead says. And he worked under Bonnie Hammer, who Vince always worked with on the, the Raw episodes on USA because she was the boss of USA at that point. And he says, Dear Vince, attached is a copy of the final report from last month's focus groups. I trust you will find it comprehensive, but if you have any questions, give me a call. So here's what they did. Some guy named Alan Browdy got a fax from some guy named Ed Wolf and another guy named Art Savitt about their WWF on USA focus groups. Apparently what they did was they went somewhere in two cities and they found some people that I'm about to describe. And they asked them questions about the wrestling programs. A series of four focus group interviews were conducted with key viewing segments. One session was recruited to consist of male teens, 15 to 16 years of age, half of whom regularly watch and prefer Raw, and half of whom regularly watch and prefer Nitro. Do you know how they defined who, how they regularly watch Raw or Nitro? No. If they watch it at least once a month, they said that was a regular watcher. Oh, that's ridiculous. Of course it is. Because it's a television company doing a focus group on wrestling. And they don't know who the fucking wrestling fans are, or where to find them, or what they fucking are watching to begin with. Then they did two sessions recruited to consist of men 20 to 29 years of age, half regularly watch Nitro, half regularly watch Raw, and a session with men 30 to 39 years of age, half of whom occasionally watch Raw and half of whom occasionally watch Nitro. What's occasionally? The adults, 20 to 29, they call it regularly if they watch twice a month or more. And the 30 to 39-year-old men occasionally is once a month for them. So basically, and here's another thing. Uh, where is this? Um, in addition, all respondents had cable or a dish at home and were able to name on an unaided basis current WWF and WCW wrestlers. <laughs> well, it's good they didn't need aid. They didn't need help. So, and here's the thing. They also said, ah, in reading the findings of this study, the following caution should be kept in mind. Qualitative information drawn from small samples cannot be precise as to how many consumers hold one opinion over another, nor can it represent their entire range of opinions and attitudes. The report inevitably contains a certain amount of interpretation on the part of the analyst. And they don't tell you how many people were in these groups. 
so basically what they've done is they've found a small groups of males, 15 to 16, 20 to 29, and 30 to 39, that either watch one or other of the wrestling shows once or twice a month. And guess where they did the focus groups, Brian? Uh, USA Network, uh, Los Angeles and New York? No. It might have come out better if they had. Kansas City and Atlanta. Interesting. Kansas City may technically be a neutral location, although it wasn't the strongest wrestling market in the world for anybody to begin with, but Atlanta... They they expected to find WWF fans in Atlanta in 1997. And it says, in terms of actual representation obtained ac across all four sessions, Nitro versus Raw preference ran at about 65 to 35. So their own study says 65% of the people prefer Nitro. Because half the study was done in Atlanta. So anyway, here's the summary of the key findings, Brian, from the USA Network survey. While most respondents were aware that Nitro and Raw were on TV on Monday evenings and they were now head-to-head -head for two hours, viewing for most was non-ritualistic and not a mental appointment. So they're not wrestling fans. They're not wrestling fans. They, did, they watch, well, you know, teenagers watch once a month. And these adults that they found wherever once, twice a month, we're good. Now, needless to say, there were a few teens and a few frequent viewers who religiously turned to Raw or Nitro at the proper time. However, these devoted few were a clear minority. Uh, respondents also reported switching, surfing from one to the other, depending on who's wrestling, current storyline, amount of action versus talking, type of match, and commercials. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Taping of the shows, viewing reruns, and Saturday specials viewing occur frequently among the most avid of fans. We would have never had a way to know that otherwise. Okay, here's the strengths and positives about the WWF. The viewers were positive about WWF for its having several name wrestlers. Undertaker, seen as savage but highly regarded. Psycho Sid, scary, crazy, and unpredictable. Steve Austin. And here was the tip-off that they were in Atlanta. Steve Austin, seen as someone who would be a good horseman. <laughs> Looks mean. Bret Hart. Well, you, do you think ahead. they had any idea when someone said he looks like he would be a good horseman that they meant a group that's in WCW as opposed no. to oh, someone who should be on a horse. No, they did. They have no idea. It's USA Network people that didn't know anything about wrestling, finding people on the street or wherever and asking them about wrestling. Bret Hart is described as a pretty boy crybaby who whines a lot. So Vince was in the survey. Well, <laughs> and British Bulldog, capable but crybaby. The heel, this at the time where Brett was starting to be anti-America, the pro-Canada thing, Brett and Davey and the Hart Foundation, the Canada versus USA, so he's whining, he's a crybaby. Listen to this. WWF is seen as having good technical wrestlers such as Mexicans. <laughs> Some see the WWF as having powerful wrestlers with good power moves. And by the way, obviously, this is when on the WCW is bringing in the cruiserweights, so they've mixed that up. We we had a very brief dalliance with, remember, trying to work with Pena, and that didn't work out. But that would have been around this period of time in 97 where they would have had luchadors appearing randomly on Raw and at the Royal Rumble earlier that yeah, year. Yeah, but were any of those guys people you would consider good technical wrestlers instead of the fucking guys they had fucking Mysterio and everybody in WCW? I thought WCW had the better crop of luchadors. Yeah. Yes. Well, the point. Anyway, here are more strengths of the WWF. The production is highly regarded, especially the glitziness of the noise, music, smoke, and lights. 
The announcers are well-liked. Attractive and sexy women are a plus, particularly Sonny, who was mentioned as an emerging personality. WWF camera work was singled out and mentioned as a positive. WWF has an acknowledged history and heritage. Viewers respect that the WWF has been around longer and is the older league. <laughs> because they had no idea where the other one came from. WWF weakness and negatives. The WWF was criticized for sometimes being boring. That it allows too many lulls in the action or not enough sustained action. You're going to see a theme here. Basically, WCW was already hot-shotting and already trying to fucking throw everything on the wall and see what would stick. And Vince didn't want to do that because he was didn't want to damage his business, but things are getting to the point where he's going to have to do something. But then he sees this survey from the network from these fucking casual fans at the mall that watch once a month, and, oh, we need more car wrecks. And here we go. Many felt that WWF does not have enough marquee name wrestlers. Currently, Undertaker and Psycho Sid are seen as the two biggest stars in the WWF because they were just on top at WrestleMania. But can you tell me that any devoted WWF fan at that point in time would have not said Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin, Davy Boy, British Bulldog, Bret Hart, these are the top names, Sid. Was It was Psycho Sid and Undertaker, two biggest stars. The other marquee names, Bret Hart, British Bulldog, Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, are not the ones that most of the viewers tune in to watch. There's too much talking and not enough action. WWF storylines are weak, less well-sustained, too predictable, and silly. I'm sure Vince loved seeing this. Because he hated the word, I used the word silly to the point where Bruce had to tell me stop using the word silly. I said, well, what is a goddamn synonym of silly? There are few perceived up-and-coming inside the ring stars. After Undertaker, viewers didn't name anyone new in the WWF who would fit the role of good guy. <laughs> viewers clearly felt there was not enough perceived mayhem either in or out of the ring. Fans would like to see such havoc tied to the action of the match and the evolving storyline. An increase of more realistic, per parenthetically, i.e. better acted hits, coupled with more realistic, parenthetically, better simulated blood, and less bad acting would better serve the viewer. So they think the blood was fake. They want better acted hits and less bad acting. Well, I can get behind that one as well. The fact that WWF offers good technical wrestlers may limit the amount of perceived real violence that it can provide. <laughs> Too many moves <laughs> I do not satisfy those WWF viewers who have a thirst for more and better portrayed riotous disorder. Oh, boy. Uh, tag teams in the WWF are seen as weaker than they should be. No WWF standout marquee tag team other than the Legion of Doom was ever mentioned or discussed. Imagine that. Even the casual fans pick up on that. Bing, bing, bing. Again, the WWF's thought to have too many pretty boys in its stable of wrestlers. Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. <laughs> You think Brett would have fucking liked being called a pretty boy? WWF wrestlers, the matches, the action, and violence are seen as being overly staged, fake, and obviously preordained. Brian? Yes? It's almost like if there was somebody that was saying, hey, we should do more real-looking shit instead of this phony, silly... And if they thought it was phony and silly in 1997, what would they think now? It's really a rejection of Vince's brand of wrestling at that yes. time. Yes. And in bad matchups abound, too often WWF will pit one champion contender level wrestler against a powder puff good guy. <laughs> or whatever. Mismatches. WCW strengths and positives. 
WCW provides its viewers with numerous storylines, not just one or a few. These are being seen as suspenseful and original with lots of unexpected twists. Now you see where he wants to go. WCW is seen as constantly reshaping and evolving its characters and wrestlers. WCW is seen as having the most popular wrestlers and known names. And <laughs> what do you think Vince saw when he read these known names? Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Roddy Piper, <laughs> Ric Flair, Sting, the NWO, and the Four Horsemen. Uh, WCW affords the viewer with action both in and out of the ring with unpredictable outcomes. WCW is seen to be intense and hardcore in its matches, dialogues, action, in and out of the ring, and its promos. WCW shows brawls, provides visceral excitement, is mean-spirited, and seemingly violent. Controversy is seen as one more perceived positive aspect about WCW. And here's their weaknesses. They are seen as not providing enough technical wrestling with good, clean, scientific moves and holds. <laughs> Bischoff and the other WCW announcers are negatively perceived. There are too many hangers-on involving entourages. They are seen as not wrestling as much as they are promoting, posturing, talking up, and stirring up emotions. And evil over good is also the pervasive storyline theme constantly shown by the WCW. So basically, they're telling Vince, hey Vince, you've been doing the same thing for a while and people don't believe your stuff anymore because you got too silly. And the work with the guys was not as bad at that point as they made it out to be in this report, but in WCW, they were doing more wrestling angles and more wrestling bullshit, but they were also all over the place, and it was chaos, and that can be attractive to a viewer. However, as we saw WCW, this was when they were getting hot, and they got hot and didn't know what to do with it, and three years and 11 months from the time that this was written, they were out of business after losing $60 million in the previous 18 months. So the chaos draws eyeballs, but you can't build a whole company on chaos and keep it that way. During this period of time, to the best of your knowledge, did Vince watch any of the competitive product more than he had before or after? Well, more than he had before or after would have been any, because he never did, and no. He'd get the Finkel report. If somebody specifically said, Vince, look at this clip or look at this commercial spot or whatever, but he, I don't know that he ever, maybe he did it at home alone like other people watch German porn, where he closed the drapes and made sure nobody else was home and then watched it, but not in front of anybody. But, but that was the thing. That it was more wrestling and more... Well, we've talked about this a million times. Hall and Nash kicked it off. They thought there was an invasion. And then Hogan switches heel, and there's a fresh coat of paint on the legendary icon. And then Bischoff gets the checkbook to where he can hire a few more people. And then the tide starts turning. And it's also still at the heart of it down south, a wrestling program. So they're more violent. They're doing more angles. But they're really fucking hitting the gas pedal. And, you know, if, unfortunately, if Vince wanted to do wild-ass wrestling angles, he had, you know, five people on the fucking, already in, in the company working there that could have done him wild-ass wrestling. But he decided he wanted to do the wild-ass Jerry Springer show. And there was only one person there that could or would or would be willing to pitch shit like that. And that's where we ended up with that kind of chaos instead of the wrestling chaos we just had chaos chaos but thankfully i don't know that we would have won the war had it not been for austin and the rock because that you know and the fact that bischoff and none of them down south knew how to run a wrestling company for any length of time 
because they were drunk on the smell of their own farts. But I don't think we would have won without Austin and Rock because when you go back and look, without Austin and Rock, and there's Taker and Mick and a few other people stepped up, but the the creative in the WWF was worse than WCW's. It just, the stars that were doing it were over like God. And their creative was fine. I'm talking about up and down the, you know, we've talked about those miserable shows and the birthing the hands and the whole nine yards. But when you get the dreck out of it, what this report basically said was the WWF had got boring and WCW was more exciting, sort of like now. WWF has got massively boring and the show on the other, the Turner Network is more exciting. But the problem becomes then that this time, Tony didn't necessarily steal all the stars from Vince. He got them from the indies. And these guys don't know how to keep themselves, get themselves over, keep themselves over, and the chaos eventually burns out. So is this thing going to end up the same way? Now that Vince is gone, he apparently wasn't taking AEW seriously, and I don't blame him when you watch a couple of the shows. But now Triple H is going to. So is he going to make wwf more exciting but not in such a hokey way as during the attitude era so they can compete with the more exciting program that's less professionally produced and with a infrastructure of running a company that can't compete in any way shape or form with the one in stamford so is the hot shotting down south going to self-destruct another company but is, there are interesting similarities. The, the point being, all the problems start with the WWF getting boring. And then they got to go too far in the other direction to, to correct that. But the strengths versus weaknesses analysis is basically this. WCW was seen to have more known names and popular wrestlers, i.e. more stars. And then the opening... The fucking list of those is Hogan, Savage, Piper, and then Flair, and then Sting, the NWO that all came from Vince and the Four Horsemen, which didn't exist anymore. And the storylines, WCW owns the stronger position because the storylines are more numerous, which is the same thing that Shitstain then tried to do in the WWF, write for everybody. Problem is, when you write for everybody, then you immune people to the angles that only the top people should be doing. Hey, we've seen hot shotting in the past. I mean, Jim Barnett famously hot shotted right when he sold Australia to get the business really popping. And we can understand why it was, in a lot of ways, a necessary component of the Monday Night War because it was a war. It was two promotions right. and two shows head to head. How do you come back from hot shotting? Eventually, the hot shotting has to end, whether it's you know, a couple months or a month or whether it's a few years or however many <laughs> weeks the war was going on. How do you come back from that? Well, it, it never lasted a couple of years till the Attitude Era, because even in the 80s, when Vince and Crockett were jousting with each other. Vince was not really hot shotting. He just had an incredible roster and was running three shows a night and Dusty that wasn't really hot shotting for Dusty. That's the way Dusty booked. And he learned it from Watts and Eddie Graham, the package shows, and he kept them up. Hot shotting would be going into Starcade or whatever, but there was a lot of shit going on with Dusty normally. But hot shotting with territories would last a matter of weeks or months. If you weren't in a promotional war, but you just, your business was down or you needed to do something, do a heavy angle, do heavy blood, do something violent, something shocking, whatever, and juice that thing up for a few weeks and see if that works. If you're in a promotional war, Sheik and Bruiser, Indianapolis and Detroit, they brought in the top talent they could get, and they put on the biggest cards they could get, and both companies prospered. Indianapolis was never hotter than 72 to 74. Detroit was never hotter. And they got so hot that they would draw in Detroit on the same night. There'd be 20,000 people at live wrestling in Detroit in the same night for the two shows. 
But after eventually Sheik won and that he turned Bruiser away from Michigan and Bruiser won in Indiana, then the, the Sheik never really invaded and they agreed to coexist and work together. Their territories went downhill from there until they fucking died because there were the, the people had gotten used to the major name talent. The people had gotten used to the big cards. Well, now that they weren't having to fight somebody off, they couldn't have, and they didn't have as many towns, especially Bruiser. He didn't have Detroit once every two or three weeks to pay guys on. So you get lesser name talent doing lesser stuff because you've already done all the angles and all the blood you can do. And you, so that was a two year period. And they, and, and that wasn't even rampant hot shotting on television every week, like happens today. So the attitude era really was the only time that it went on that long in the history of the business anywhere, because if any just regular territory had done that, they would have gone out of business in six months. You can't follow it. And we've been trying to follow it for 20 years. The numbers keep dropping. And I knew that at the time, and I was like, what the fuck? That's why when you, when the WWF had Austin and Rock and Taker and Mankind and that level of talent, and, and especially Austin and Rock got over, then they should have immediately cut back on doing anything with the underneath guys and saved the angles and saved the fucking, just saved the chaos. Because that wasn't making any difference in the program. But as it was, you know, no. So, yeah, so the answer to how long, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, but never that long. And I brought up Jim Barnett in Australia. He hot-shotted it. The place was on fire. He sold it, and they were never able to come close, for a number of reasons, but they were never able to come close to the levels yeah. that it had been before. Well, and that was an old promoter's trick also. You want to sell a town or you want to sell a territory or whatever, hot shot it, get business up, bring the guy in that you want to buy it, sees the big crowds, oh yeah, and get the fuck out of there before he realizes how you did it. Um, and then the, the uh, just again, with all of this, the strengths and weaknesses, WCW had more action and energy, brawling, hardcore mayhem, which can break out at any point. WWF is more laid back with less destructive, less aggressive action, more often contained in the ring. Imagine that. Violence and blood. WCW, more perceived violence and blood. WWF was uh, ahead in announcers, technical wrestling, production, sexy characters because of Sonny. And the WWF's best wrestlers wrestle, whereas WCW's best don't. Because WCW's biggest stars that we just mentioned, Hogan, Flair, Piper, Sting, they actually would never wrestle on television. Sting was in the rafters. So that's the thing. Um, basically, they some you know fans at the mall somewhere wanted more chaos in the program, and. You know, that's what they decided to do to fight this war. To go back to the beginning here, so this survey, this focus group, whatever you want to call it, this study, this was commissioned by the USA Network on their yes. own, or they went to Vince and said, this is something we want to no, do? No, they, they did it. They did it. Uh, it said there was another similar research was conducted in January of this year. And they just wanted to find out what was going on. And imagine this now. Imagine this. This is a list of what, whether the fan was watching Raw or Nitro, what was most likely to make them tune out. And again, a lot of these things, they have a firm grasp of the obvious, right? Here's what makes a casual wrestling fan tune out. Anything overly fake. Matches with unknowns. Long, boring holds, headlocks, moves, or anything too scientific. <laughs> Speeches in the ring. I guess that's why they've started Raw for, with a 20-minute promo for the last 20 years, right? And again, it obviously depends on who's doing the speech. Steve Austin's going to talk for 20 minutes. That's better than somebody else wrestling for 20 minutes. But And also too much dialogue and not enough action. But the kind of things that both Raw and Nitro should be doing more often, and again, 
If you ask a kid what they want for dinner, nine out of ten times they're going to say cheeseburgers and ice cream, right? They, what kind of things should they do more often on Raw and Nitro? Specialty matches such as cage matches, specialty matches such as strap matches, even specialty matches with lesser-known wrestlers are exciting. More recognizable wrestlers and more tin fighter brawls. <sighs> this explains a lot. Uh, a typical WWF viewer fan base is seen as comprised of younger teens, preteens, or very older fan with some women because they are attracted to pretty boys. Typical WCW viewer is seen as Southern because <laughs> they're in Atlanta. Less respectful, a hardcore fan who won't miss a match, a male 18 to 49. That was the WCW fan base that hadn't been run off. They kept waiting for Crockett Promotions to come back. And uh, that's... The term I mean, pretty boy being used so much is interesting. I know, because I'm thinking, did they get four fucking... Because these are all men that were surveyed between 18 and 39... I'm wondering, did they just get like three or four of each and two guys said, yeah, he's a pretty boy. And that became Bret Hart's the pretty boy, Bret Hart. Yeah, to get viewers to spend more time watching Raw, it is indicated that the dynamic of action should be addressed. More action and energy, less talking and dialogue. The action could be made to appear more destructive. See, they've still got to make sure they know it's fake. More intense, more realistic havoc and mayhem. More action outside the ring. More wanton destruction and mayhem are indicated as well. <laughs> what the fuck? You got fucking five meth heads with short attention spans, and this is what fucking ruined the wrestling business. Um, and again, we have no idea, like you said, in terms of even if you want to apply this a study and use these results in a positive way, you don't know how many people were talked to. You don't know no, really it any information say. that would be tangible. And it, it, Sonny is all over. The, apparently, Sonny was the only girl we had then. They loved Sonny. And we should create new and more exciting storylines to increase the level of fan appeal of British Bulldog Bret Hart with an E, H-A-R-T-E, Steve Austin and Psycho Sid so that WWF is not too reliant on its one overwhelmingly strongest asset, Undertaker. Utilize Sonny to the greatest extent possible. Other sexy women should be introduced and used. Personalities from WWF's heydays, H-A-Y days, heydays. Sammartino and Morales should be brought back and utilized. <laughs> Who said this in the fucking This focus? is the USA Network. Um, bring in Bruno or Pedro as manager of a new specially tailored team. <laughs> Bruno Consider can manage the Italians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. But anyway, there you go. And Vince McMahon was having second thoughts and doubts because of all the stuff that's going on. Like I said, he lost Sean. He lost the champion. WrestleMania went in the tank. The fucking raw ratings were down. But again, did he ever express to you that he was afraid of losing USA Network? Um, well, he always wanted to keep him happy. He would, he never said, you know, we're going to lose them if we don't do something. But he, you know, he wanted their interest to stay with the, the program, obviously. But back then, there was no rights fee. I mean, there may have been a, some kind of production payment. I can't remember. It was negligible if it was. And and, I, and WWF got some of the commercial time back at that point. But the money was made with live events, merchandise, and pay-per-view. 